This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic 10, Product Concepts. Hey, let's, uh, let's do a quick review of some of the points we've, we've covered so far. Remember, kind of generally, we kind of think of a, of a product as a tangible, service intangible, but as, what, as we have seen now, Every offering, and that's the key word, it's an offering, is some combination of tangibles and intangibles. Yeah, a Mercedes-Benz is something to drive. It's also a symbol of um, prestige and personal fulfillment. A uh, floral bouquet is not flowers, it's love. Um, a motel room airline seat, we have the physical product component, plus we've got the service product component. And as we have seen at this point, what really sells are the intangibles, love, happiness, prestige, affiliation with uh, an aspirational reference group, and so forth. And, of course, we need tangible cues to sell intangible offerings, symbols, personnel, building grounds, and so forth. Now, we had noted um, business products in topic seven. Now let's look at consumer products. And in consumer products, uh, these are the different types of consumer products. And no, these classifications we've got here are generalizations. They may not be appropriate for all persons in all situations, as we're going to see here. And the classification of these of products is based upon how much effort is generally expended in shopping for them. <clears throat> so first item, we have a convenience product. Usually, a convenience product, relatively inexpensive, routinely purchased, little shopping effort. Uh, you go into the 7-Eleven uh, to buy some milk, you grab a Coke and a couple of donuts or something like that. Or variation of that, you're totally loyal to Bridgestone, but you're driving I-70 out in western Kansas, and you get a flat right about Goodland, and a uh, guy says, okay, well, I'll tell you what we can do. Uh, we, can, we can get you a Bridgestone out of Denver, but it won't get here till tomorrow. But I got a mission. I can put a mission on it today. It's for you at that situation. That's, tan that's a convenience product. Yep. Put on the Michelin. Uh, let me get out of here, uh, which, by the way, may well be the end of your loyalty to Bridgestone. There is something to be said in, uh, in marketing, even for not a traditional convenience product, just be there, just show up. Same thing is true in sales as well, show up. Um, and, but in, in the products we think of generally of convenience product, key element of distribution, uh, get it out there, intense levels of distribution, very wide and intense distribution. Then we have shopping products, and shopping products, more expensive, um, less intense distribution, we're going to require some more shopping effort. Within these, we have something which is called a homogeneous shopping product. <clears throat> we'll come back to, uh, to that category in a bit. But in what's called a homogeneous shopping product, they're generally perceived as basically all the same. Price is the key. So uh, often cited in this washers, dryers, TV sets. It's a washing machine. It's a washer's a washer. That's about it. Uh, you want a CD, certificate of deposit. Uh, what bank's paying the highest interest rate? They're all the same. They're all insured. No, no difference at all like this. Contrast this to a heterogeneous shopping product. We have their identifiable product features, such as style, quality, image, and so forth. So furniture, uh, clothing, certainly a suit at Walmart is not a suit at, a, at a, an exclusive clothier. An apartment, three-bedroom apartment is not generic product. Uh, a university, I would hope that a university would, uh, would be considered distinctive in some way. Uh, the University of West Florida shouldn't offer the same degree that would Florida State or an online university if they're all the same. If they're all the same, you ain't got much going for you but price. Uh, then we have specialty products. Uh, specialty products perceived as unique. Uh, brand loyal will accept no substitute. People go out of their way to get them. Often cited as specialty products. Things like a Rolls Royce or a Rolex. On a Rolls Royce, by the way, though. The true aristocrats drive Bentleys. It's the nouveau riche that drive Rolls Royce, so buy yourself a Bentley. But same thing as, as sort of in the, the business of, about uh, tires being a convenience product. Levi 501s, Clorox, Heinz, for a lot of people, ketchup, they wouldn't have any kind of ketchup at Heinz. It's a specialty product for them. <clears throat> so even though it's a product which can seem like a, a pretty basic product, that's ketchup. Yeah. but. For some people, it's a specialty product. So the challenge for a marketer is to make a shopping product or even a convenience product to be a special product, especially good in the, in the mind to a core group of loyal users. So a homogeneous shopping product, 
I don't think it's any such thing. It's saying, remember, they're saying they're all the same. No. When you say you're marketing a homogeneous shopping product, what it really means, buddy, is you're a lousy marketer. Anything can be distinguished. Um, aspirin, Bayer certainly has distinguished themselves as a specialty product for a lot of people. I mentioned washers, dryers as being uh, basically all the same. Um, Maytag, Maytag's made it. Um, I just did a CD, I got it at, at uh, Bank of Pensacola. It's always gonna be Bank of Pensacola to me. But got one there. I guess I might have been able to get a tenth of a point better interest rate someplace else. I didn't care, I get a relationship with the people there. And so therefore, that's, that's where I'm going to want to do my business. So the relationship means something. Then we finally have unsought products. Basically, unsought products, they're unknown to you. Uh, you're not aware of them. You're not seeking them until the need arises or, um, or you're made aware of them one way or another. So like insurance. I don't think too many people sit around thinking, I might need some insurance today. Uh, cemetery plots, you're not probably thinking about that until someone comes up to you, Salesforce or someone, and points out, hey, you may not have thought about insurance. There's, there's some things you might want to consider about this. Um, cemetery plots. Well, when you're getting on in years, as some people are, stop looking at me, but as some people are, you get to come to the point, you know, wouldn't it be nice for those that you're going to leave behind to know that when your time comes that all the arrangements have been taken care of and prepaid and everything else like that so that your relatives, when your relatives are noticed, they can just simply arrive and say, we want to see Bob, and here he is in just a basic plastic box. Here's Bob, already paid for, already done. Um, so plumbers, same deal. I'm not thinking about a plumber until I need a plumber. All of a sudden, I want a plumber. What am I going to do? I'm going to Google. And I, I put in plug, Plumbers Pensacola, and who pops up? That's how I'm going to look, how I'm going to look for it. Unsought, though, at the time. So within this, let's consider the concept of a product item, a product line, and a product mix. <clears throat> and probably the best way to do this Let's just go and take a glance at some of Campbell's uh, product lines and mix. Let's look at them specifically here and just get an idea of what it is that we're talking about within those lines. So in Campbell's, I've had, this is a partial list of them here. We got some of their soups, we got some of their beverages, but this will, this will help us get there. A product item is this a specific version of a product or a service. So V8 there, V8 is a product item. Now, one thing to note about this, on V8, um, the 16 ounce and the 64 ounce bottle are each product items. <clears throat> a product line is a group of closely related product items. So Campbell's has their line of soups, they have their line of beverages, like Stouffer has their line of frozen entrees. The product mix, product mix is everything. That's the grand total, a composite list of everything that the organization offers overall. Now, and think about this, some things when you talk about the terms, we often talk about the width of a product mix for a company. Well, that the width of the mix is how many lines you got, how wide is it? In our example we showed there, Campbell has two uh, lines, which is just a partial list of what they got. You expand then your product line width when you add a new line, or in, in, its, ex, in its extremity, you diversify. So like a fashion clothier goes into um, the hotel business uh, they're going into a whole new line of business. The depth of your product line is the number of the products within the line. Now, again, we're coming down to some implications of strategy here. You would expand your product line depth when you add a new product item to an existing line. So Campbell's adds V8 brand orange and mango juice, and thus, by the way, they now have made V8 a family brand. We'll get down and talk about some of these uh, implications of branding strategies in a bit. But that's in that particular case, I have now a deeper line of products. Now, in, in, in the list here we had, we had Campbell's had four brands we listed of beverages. Now, keep in mind with this that, as we noted, there may be a number of different product items uh, within each brand. But when we're looking at, as we have in the note up here, when, when I'm talking in the real world about how deep your product line is, I'm generally talking about how many brands you have instead of how many individual packages that you might happen to have. So we can, can sometimes, in, in working our, uh, our marketing strategy, come through adjustments that we would have to deal with in, uh, in, in, our, in our products. Uh, simple enough, a product modification. That's a functional improvement or a change in style. So very common recently, we've seen people eliminate trans fats 
in, uh, in food products. Uh, product repositioning, we just did that in topic nine. Line extension, let's talk about this one for a little while here. In theory, extending a line. The theory is we can do, we can compete more broadly and do it a whole lot cheaper with a recognized name. Let's come back to the thing in V8. <clears throat> V8 wants to go into mango juice. Okay, their feeling is, we, people will recognize V8 as a name. So they, they immediately know it's gotta be quality, they recognize it, it's, 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 it's gonna get recognized early on. But what we've done with that is now, of course, it's no longer an individual brand, it's a family brand which will have implications on branding strategies. The flip side of that one, line contraction, we get rid of the dogs. Please get rid of them sooner, not later. So for Coca-Cola, Mr. Pibb, Fresca, Tab, uh, the dogs. They, uh, they probably don't justify the shelf space. Maybe we want to get rid of them entirely. So then, as we've alluded to, we have the concept of a brand. Now, in a brand, I'm talking about here uh, the use of a name, uh, a term, a logo, design, or any combination thereof that identifies and differentiates a product. So let's look at the specific components of a brand. And we have in this, first of all, the brand name. Those are words that can be spoken. So Cadillac. Cadillac, uh, that's a car, Cadillac's a dog food also. <clears throat> a brand mark are symbols that cannot be spoken. You're all familiar with the Nike swoosh, the Mercedes star. It's a symbol, it's a brand mark. A logo then, logo traditionally is a script of the company name, but it's, the, the term logo now is a lot broader than it used to be. It's now a symbol or a script that represents the brand or the company. Uh, the old way of talking about it was strictly the name of the company, Ford, the way Ford writes out Ford, the way Coca-Cola writes out Coca-Cola. We also now use the term logo to represent a lot of brand marks. The Saints with their Fleur de Lis. Uh, Mercedes with their brand mark uh, is really a logo. It's, it's now looked at as being a logo as well. That star from Mercedes, that represents what Mercedes is. We then have trademark, service mark, uh, legally protected, Brand name, brand mark, logo, or phrase. So Cadillac, okay, Cadillac, the name is not protected. Uh, Cadillac, um, unfortunately, did not protect it back in the 30s, and we'll note that in a bit here, but their script and their crest is protected. So Cadillac, I can have anything for Cadillac. I can have a Cadillac car wash. There's a Cadillac ranch outside of Las Vegas, which is a house of prostitution. I can call it Cadillac but I can't use the Cadillac script or the crest because that is trademark, that is protected. Um, university, FSU, Florida State, or, the, or their Indian logo, they're protected. Uh, I can use, like, I, now, it's interesting how this all works out. I went to the University of Georgia. If I have, I can't, I can't print a t-shirt that says UGA, that's the University of Georgia. I can't say University of Georgia, but I have a t-shirt, which is a red t-shirt, with black letters and white outlines on the letters that says Georgia not protected, George is a state, so I can, I can, you can say that, but you can't say UGA, that's, that's the one protected. Uh, we have right here at the university, we had, um, we had the, the cross country team came out with a, uh, with a t-shirt that says on it, West Florida cross country. They didn't say UWF cross country, or University of West Florida cross country, but just West Florida, that being a region. Also protected in this area here, co uh, commercial positioning concept statements, some of these are amazing. Now you're living this protected Cox Cable. Use it or lose it, it's protected. Rogaine. Then we have brand equity. Um, brand equity is a concept. You remember your accounting course where you looked at the goodwill on the balance sheet and you kind of wondered what that at? That's it. That is basically the reputation, the loyalty for which a customer is willing to pay more for. Uh, a product on the shelf, a branded product vis-a-vis -a, -vis a private label. Or even just say, uh, let's go back to Coca-Cola. You got that Coca-Cola plant down there on Davis. Um, it's a physical facility. Okay, it's worth a certain amount as a Coca-Cola plant. As a Bob's Cola plant, that facility is worth a whole lot less money because it being able to be producing the brand Coca-Cola makes it worth a whole lot more. That's its brand equity. And then we have <clears throat> the generic product, generic brand, and generic product names. So and it's important within this to know the difference between a generic product and a generic brand. <clears throat> a generic product says no physical difference among the brands. So I got aspirin, aspirin's aspirin. Sugar, 
87 octane unleaded gas with, uh, with ethanol in it. It's all the same. Though, with the, though the product might be the same, firms, as we've noted, can and do differentiate with image, uh, packaging, service, convenient, and so forth. Generic brand, on the other hand, that's no brand. Haven't seen much of those in the last 40 years. Back in the last serious, serious economic downtrend of the 70s, many uh, supermarkets were having a lot of generic brands. They'd have a product on the shelf that said ketchup. Just a white label and black print, ketchup. And it was the lowest quality, the lowest price, and no apology for it. In my beer can collection, I have one that says beer. I have another one that says light beer. Oh, they were awful, but I did finish them. But that's very different than the strategy that the chains have today. If you've noticed, you're going to Publix. Their private labels are very high quality. And that gets you in the store to buy the other stuff. So that's a different strategy today. I haven't seen a, a generic uh, brand forever, just about. Then we have a generic product name. Now, this is, this is the one that kind of getting on the things we talked about before. Common name may once have had trademark protection, but now is in the public domain, Cadillac. <clears throat> Cadillac, back in the 30s, you had companies coming out and uh, having things like the Cadillac car wash. General Motors' reaction was, gee, that's great, because people are using the name Cadillac, and they put it on something that means it's the best. So they let it go. Well, it may have been for a while saying this is the best, but all of a sudden they've lost their trademark protection. And now everything, including that house of prostitution, can have the name Cadillac on it. Um, a big fear of that is Xerox. Uh, Xerox is kind of wondering, um, <clears throat> gee, what happens? Hey, would you run me a Xerox on this? Well, that's not a Xerox. That, a Xerox is a copy made on a Xerox brand copier. Uh, Coca-Cola. Same deal. I'm sure you've had the situation happen. You go into a fast food place, you say, I'd like to have, uh, give me a burger, fries, and a Coke. And they say to you, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have Coke. Would a Pepsi be okay? You say, well, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, because Coca-Cola is a brand of, of cola. It is not just brown pop in a bottle, all the same. And Coca-Cola is very concerned that this become a generic product name. So by the way, at Coke, um, they have a position. They call it trade research. You can get it out of college. You can have this for one year only because you burn out on this job. What you do in Coca-Cola trade research is you're on expense account for a year. You have no residence. You live in a hotel the whole time. So you can put some money away. So your job all day is to go on accounts that you know do not serve Coca-Cola. And uh, you go in there and you can order burger fries and a Coke. Well, you can, in many places, by the end of the day, you just order a Coke, order a small Coke, because otherwise you'd be eating all day. But you walk into an account you know does not serve Coca-Cola, and you go up and say, I like burger fries and a Coke. And that's your lunch. And hopefully the person says, hey, I'm sorry, we don't have Coke with a Pepsi do all right. And they go, oh, Pepsi, uh, I'm, out I'm out of here and walk out of there. But some of the times what they do is they hand you the product, which you know is not Coke, because you know Coke doesn't serve that account. So you take the product out there, you put it in a little test tube, you put the cap on it, and you label it, you send it back to Atlanta to the lab. And what they do then is they would have someone from the bottling company, after that's verified, go into that account and explain, hey, we'd love to sell you Coca-Cola. Uh, a lot of your customers want Coca-Cola, so yeah, we, we, we'd like to get you in here. But please do understand, it's a trademark name. And so if someone asks for Coca-Cola and you don't have it, you need to explain that, I'm sorry, we don't have Coca-Cola. Will a Pepsi be OK? All well and good. Trade research comes back there in about another month. They go through the same thing. If they get served again without being told, hey, I'm sorry, we don't have Coca-Cola, they get sent a, a letter from the attorney. Cease and desist. Make sure that you get this right now because we're going to take action. A month later, they go back and do it again. If that happens, they sue them. Got to. Got to protect it. I'm sure Xerox does the same sort of thing. If there's a Xerox rep driving her territory and, and she sees a sign on a store that does copies and it says Xerox copies, 25 cents, and she knows that Xerox does not have copiers in that, in that particular establishment, she would go in there and tell the same sort of thing. Say, sir, we, we, we'd love to sell you. Uh, a Xerox copier here, but please do understand, Xerox copies mean a copy made on a Xerox copier, so please, you cannot advertise that sign. Okay, that's a reasonable thing to do, to try to protect that brand and not let it get into generic, generic status. So with all this in mind, let's take a note of some of the branding strategies we have, and within that, we've got <coughs> a manufacturer's brand. <coughs> manufacturer's brand, basically, um, named by its producer, who distributes it wherever, uh, might identify the company, Kellogg's Coca-Cola, might not, Betty Crocker, uh, Folgers, 
Private brand, by contrast, uh, owned by the retailer, wholesaler, some other intermediary, and available only there. So we got Bayer at, uh, at Home Depot, Craftsman Kenmore at Sears, Sam's Choice at Walmart. Now, oh, here's an interesting thing on this, if you happen to get into consumer products and you're fighting private labels. At Coke for years, we were fighting uh, private labels, especially in Winn-Dixie. Uh, Winn-Dixie would give extraordinary amount of space to their private labels relative to sales, and a lot less for us, which does affect your sales even more. <clears throat> so we would go to them and, and try to urge them to, uh, to give us an appropriate amount of space, and they'd say, well, we, yeah, we're, yeah, but we make so much more money on the check. We make an extra 10% higher margin on the check than we do on Coke. You may on the books, fellas, but here's something you might want to think about. Um, the check gets sent from the warehouse to your door. Then your, your stock boys have to, have to build the displays and stock the shelves. The Coca-Cola guy's in here doing this for you. These are expenses you're incurring with your private label. You do not incur with Coca-Cola. Now, Coke's in the store, <coughs> direct store delivery, say three days a week at least. But even a company like Procter & Gamble, who has a rep in that store about once every four weeks, still does a lot of work. They stock the shelves, they clean the shelves, they build the display. So that's an important point to make when you're talking to store managers uh, about your branded product vis-a-vis -vis their private labels by saying, when you start talking about your profits, do consider the cost that you incur on, on merchandising the product. Individual brand, individual brand, we're saying we have different names for different brands. That's General Mills' strategy. They're going to have Bic Bisquick pancake mix, gold medal flour, uh, Betty Crocker cake mix. Family brand, we've alluded to this, now let's talk about it some more. <clears throat> Family brand is saying, I got the same brand name that identifies different items in the product lines. Kraft, that's what, that's the Kraft policy. I've got Kraft cheeses, salad dressing, barbecue sauce, and so forth. Uh, Butterball, well, Butterball used to be turkey. Then they line extended it, so Butterball's now Butterball turkey, Butterball cold cuts. That's okay, uh, we've noted now this means it's it's no longer an individual brand, it's a family brand, but turkey, cold cuts, they're pretty close. Uh, had, having said this now, what you've done is you've lost the identity and positioning of an individual brand when you do that, <clears throat> like today. What's a Chevrolet today? At one time, a Chevy was your entry-level car or truck. Today, a Chevy is anything from a, a basic car to a van to a Corvette to a heavy-duty truck and everything else. What is it? Uh, what's a Coca-Cola today? I have never really quite added up the number of, of, of product items we have under the name Coca-Cola. Coke, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Coke, Diet Coke with lime, caffeine-free, all of this stuff. Uh, what's a Budweiser today? <clears throat> Bud, Bud Light, Bud Dry, all, all over the place here. I'm not, I'm not sure what a Bud is. Then we have a master brand, and, and, a, and a master brand the positioning of the brand is synonymous with the category itself. So when I say bleach, you say Clorox. When I say coffee machines, you say Xerox. When I say ketchup, you say Heinz, which is most easily accomplished and almost requires an individual brand. So when I say cream cheese, you say Philadelphia, which is made by Kraft. Philadelphia is one of the few individual brands made by Kraft. Now think of the difference in the positioning of the mind. If Kraft made that product as Kraft brand cream cheese, it just would not have the recognizability of the brands. When I say cream cheese, you're not going to jump up and say Kraft cream cheese. That's the point on being the individual brand. It's got the identity. It stands alone. It can be a master brand. Now this family branding strategy, yes, it's, it's less costly to implement, might be appropriate for closely related items. But weed eater? <clears throat> weed eater, you know, one of those string trimmers, trim around your, your fence posts and your little trees in the yard and stuff like that. That's a weed eater. Now they have a weed eater brand leaf blower. Yeah, it's just no. <clears throat> Maybe you covered a tornado or something else like that. I can't quite see weed eater as being a family brand somehow. And then we have, <clears throat> we have co-branding where I've got two or more uh, brand names together. So I've got um, Dell computers with Intel inside. Uh, I've got my GM MasterCard. I've got 7 and 7, 7-Up seven and Seagram 7 for a drink. And, oh, I was, I was in Target. I find it very interesting going into Target to notice their branding strategies, and they're doing a lot of co-branding. I noticed that they have the Martha Stewart line of home furnishings. 
Uh, running, they had a special deal going on with them with a 40% reduction from the regular retail price. Um, also noted, they had the Michael Jackson line of children's clothing. All the boys' pants were half off. Um, finally, don't forget the packaging. Uh, packaging, by definition, should be attractive and identifiable at the point of sale. Also should be functional, people. Um, back to my days at Coke, my first, first year at Coke, they introduced the cans. Nice looking can, real nice looking. Um, very attractive and all that. Problem was, it was shaped like a baked bean can. Straight wall. The bottom didn't fit in the top of the next one. You ever had the privilege of uh, trying to stack about four, four high baked beans in your cupboard, see what happens to them? What do you think was happening in the outlets when they're trying to stack four and five layers of Coca-Cola six-pack cans in the, in the retail outlet and, they, and the, the cans wouldn't fit into each other? Didn't quite work. What they were having to do with this can, they'd put a layer of it in there, they put it in a layer of cardboard, another layer, another layer of cardboard. Number one, I got a lot of expense for cardboard. Number two, I got a lot of labor costs putting in there. Number three, how cool does that look when it sells down a little bit? I got these pieces of cardboard strewn all over the place. Hey, when you design the can, keep in mind, what's it gonna be used for? Not just an individual person drinking it, but it's gonna be on display in outlets where it's gonna have to be stacked. And in the beverage section, it's gonna have to be stacked. How do we design it so it stacks properly? How do you design something so it fits on the pallets properly? So it fits in the, in the truck bays? <clears throat> Back the same days. Pepsi, big, big product in, in the, um, big, big package in, in the northeast part of the country back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, was a 10 ounce one-way bottle. It was 70% of the home market. Uh, the Pepsi 10 ounce one-way bottle was a quarter inch shorter than the Coke 10 ounce one-way bottle. Like, what difference would that make? You couldn't hold the two in your hand, you couldn't hardly tell the difference. Yeah, except in the gondola, that's that bottom shelf in the store, which is a standard size, because Pepsi's was a quarter inch shorter, they could stack them five high. Coca-Cola's being a quarter inch higher, they could only stack them four high and then put another six pack on the sideways on the shelf. So we only got 90% of the inventory, and again, how cool does it look when you got your top laying there on the side? Little stuff like that. Folks, we come back down, marketing is simple. Marketing is so simple, but it's all the question of the execution, the implementation on it, think about it, at every step in the marketing process. Anyhow, that's topic 10. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.